Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Planning Commission podcast. Today's episode, Know-It-All Planners with Lee Jinke, Managing Partner at Pontifex Capital. The Planning Commission podcast is a discussion you never even knew you needed. Sit back, join us for a conversation between a couple of old friends and their guests to talk about all the things that are happening in this wide-ranging profession called planning. Our views are our own and don't reflect those of any national planning organizations or any particular public agencies and only belong to us. So read your commission packet, know your Robert's rules, and enjoy this, the Planning Commission Podcast. All right, let's take some roll. Commissioner Minshaw, you here? Present. And Commissioner Kostelik, you back? Yes, barely. All right. Thank you. Barely. Okay. And myself, we're here. We have everybody. All right. Our uh, our agenda today, our discussion item, whiskey pairing, our interview, and our lightning round. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. All Second. right. Thank you very much. And just as a reminder, you can find all our past meetings on our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Go to YouTube, Apple, Amazon, like, subscribe, and send us an email at planningcommissionpodcast at gmail.com. We always want your feedback and ideas for episodes and comments on past episodes. We appreciate it. Okay, commissioners, we're going to tear ourselves apart today, and I can't wait. I'm excited. <clears throat> are we an arrogant bunch, <laughs> or are we confident? Are we just known as being a profession of know-it-alls? Is that where what we are, or are we just simply more informed, more enlightened <laughs> than those in the development world in particular? That's what we're going to talk about today with somebody who's in the development world and is going to share that perspective from a number of fronts. So my question to you and our discussion item to kick this off, what do developers think of planners. Hmm. I think all three of us come from different backgrounds and certain ways to answer this question. Commissioner Minshaw is at the tip of the spear, I would say, in the sense at this point, we're close to it, or you know, meeting with developers on a regular basis, hearing their concerns or thoughts, their ideas, and how they may or may not sort of jive with with the the plans that are in your particular area and jurisdiction. I know for myself as a planning and zoning commissioner, we clearly right then and there are seeing it all the dang time and all the variance requests that we get and, oh, we can't afford it. Oh man, we, we just don't think that it makes sense and all of those types of things. And then the land use attorneys get in and browbeat you and tell you, you can't do it and all that. <laughs> Um, and Don, you know, I think a lot of the, like on the ADA front, that's something that you're, you're dealing with a lot. And does the development community see the value to that? Do they want to deal with that visitability, for example, in, in new projects and that sort of thing. So all three of us, I think have different perspectives on this, but you tell me what do developers think of planners? All right. I'll go first since I get to be the spear. Um, I think it depends on how how much they engage with at least the public or private sector, right? Um, on the public sector, a lot of what I hear or feel is that developers think that either planners are against them, right? That they're they're in their way, um, that they're completely bureaucratic and don't understand reality of how projects come together, um, or that we are advocates for some philosophy, advocates for some thing in the community. I think all those things are probably true at some level, uh, but it is interesting. It also depends on the developer, right? And whether they have relationships with individuals. So that's what I think. And and I would love to add a question for you and Don to answer too, which is just, but what do planners think of developers? And maybe we think about that at the end, <laughs> um, because all the things that I just said, I think mm. is also true in reverse. Uh, mm -hmm. Planners just have this general like they're on the other side of this magical veil wall that we don't understand. So I think this episode will help maybe bring that closer together. 
All right. That's a good, that's a good start. I, this is one of those when I've said in the past, like, you know, we might need a second episode or something like that. I truly believe this is one of those topics that you could probably string out two, three, four episodes and have different takes on it. Depends on the developer and the financer and, and, and the bank and I, all of that. And so anyway, go ahead, Don, what do you got? One, I would second everything Commissioner Minshaw said. I would add to that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And... That's a first. We should just make that note <laughs> okay. on the there podcast. Noted. That's a first. Noted. That's great. All right. In agreement. Ding. Um, I think that's the issue that can happen with consistency with a couple of the things Sabrina said. And I think it's important at some of those levels to separate current planning and kind of long range or comprehensive planning, because the current planning piece is clearly about development review approval policies. And when we get into long range planning, that's where we're looking to change policies to have a more desired future. But if you start to blend the two and start to ask for things outside of a policy or things outside of a plan, that's where I think it can get tied up and frustrating and coming back to even some of the ADA stuff when we have a federal government that's been sitting on public right of way stuff for 20 years, you know, at least if the policy's there and you know what to do from the start, you can design and prepare for that. It's kind of when into, you get to these random discussions and I'm sure developers when they're in an approval process and sitting there before PNZ or a council and they're negotiating stuff from the dais, <laughs> That is probably frustrating for everybody because, again, they're, they're trying to fit and meet policy as best they can, and we don't do the best job at, at making consistent policy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm going to use a word, uh, ideological. I, I suspect that there are a number of folks in the development game that and and I think Sabrina, you hit it on the head. That again, there's a whole swath of development minds, just like there's a whole swath of of any industry, really, of course, that agree with certain plans, certain you know approaches, and that sort of thing. And then there's some that absolutely just don't. Uh, but I would say I would guess that a lot of developers think of planners as being too ideological, and going to conferences in particular, careful of a planner who just came back from a conference, give them about a month or two because they're going to need to let them exercise out some of those things they just learned. Right. Um, but I have a family member, very close family member who is in the development game in a world. And man, we go back and forth about this because his perspective and my perspective are so diametrically opposed you know, and he sees me and sees my perspective, which maybe he feels is indicative of the field as being this, as against the market, so to speak, as as antithetical to what Americans want. Case in point, drive throughs You heard me say this before. Absolutely freaking loathe drive throughs I hate them. I absolutely hate them. Because I feel like as a planner, we know we're trying to get to a different landscape. We want to maximize our our limited land in, in all of the ways, all the things we've talked about. I won't pull my chain too hard. But are we going against the the, the tide <laughs> of, of the truth of this country, which is so many people prefer those and want those and developers saying, we're just trying to accommodate the desire of the American consumer. Right. And I, and they're not We're just trying either. to get a tenant. <laughs> right. 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 Of just, Hey, we, nobody wants to use the walk-up facility and therefore it doesn't pencil out and, and that sort of thing. So one example that sort of illustrates this, this uh, tension, I think that might be constantly there in varying ways. So it's I'm like going to say Dutch about how Dutch brothers does a site plan. I mean, that's just, yeah, well, <laughs> don't pull my string and I won't pull my own. So that's just tip of the spear. We're going to keep on pushing on. Um, let's, let's turn our attention to the whiskey pairing. Don, what do you have for this particular episode? Know it all planners with Lee Jinky. Well, given developer, Located in Texas, Texas, a fast growing state, things developing. I'm going to go with the Texas based uh, bourbon from the Fort Worth area, TX brand. So if you're not uh, following the growth in the whiskey industry and things that's popping up 
everywhere, but this is definitely one of the more renowned newer whiskeys that has some good flavor, <clears throat> good profile, good in a cocktail. And I would put it in a cocktail called a, Manha a Manhattan skyscraper. Follow the development theme. Not as bitter as your regular Manhattan. If you're not a vermouth fan, it's softened by either a cherry liqueur or an Amaro. So give that a whirl. I appreciate your knowledge and depth, but sometimes it concerns me that your knowledge and depth is too knowledgeable and deep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got to come over and have the Mezcal Old Fashions that I've oh, oh, yeah. been making. Now yeah. I like Mezcal Old Fashions. All right. All right. Very good. All right, real quick, before we get into our interview, we're going to take a quick second and thank our friends at Planet Edison for supporting today's podcast. If you are looking to sharpen your urban planning skills and advance your urban planning career, head on over to Planet Edison Courses, which offers over 300 courses on cutting-edge planning topics and skills, such as parking reform, missing middle housing, equity analysis, and climate resilience. Visit courses.planedison.com forward slash PC10 to take advantage of an exclusive offer for Planning Commission podcast listeners. All right, time to introduce our guest. G Lee Jinke is a managing partner at Pontifex Capital. And Lee, first of all, thank you for taking the time out. I'm sure you can't wait to just, again, hit <laughs> us between the eyes with all these things you've been thinking. So thank you for joining us, first of all. I'm so, I'm so glad to be here, you, you, know, you three. And this is such an honor and a privilege to be surrounded by three people you know, I, I have deep respect for and, you know, ha certainly have a great relationship with Sabrina and, and we work side by side on, on a number of things. So um, thanks awesome. for having me. Awesome. Well, let's just start a little bit about you. How did you get into the development game? What draw drew you into this field? How long have you been doing it? Give us a little bit of background that way. So I have a degree in random useless facts from the University of California, <laughs> yes. Santa Barbara. Um <laughs> Otherwise known as early modern English history. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's a pathway to development. That's just it, it's a hundred percent of a pathway to development. And you know, and so so young twenty two year old Lee graduates, you know, graduates school. One wonders wonders what what he's going to do with his life. Ends up doing online marketing, and ends up moving all over the West United States doing online marketing. Has had a deep curiosity about finance deep curiosity about real estate and how does that work? And, you know, circa 2006, 2007, like it was it started really, really started to look at buying real estate while, while I was still working for an online marketing firm, you know, but just the math didn't seem to make sense. And it logically didn't make sense to me that, you know, somebody was willing to give me a loan on a property that didn't cash flow, you know, and, and so I held off for a little while. And then 08 happened, um, the company, you know, and I, I had started buying real estate on the side there and still working. And then the company I was working for laid me off. And I, and by that time I was making just as much money, um, with the real estate that I owned as I was working. So it's like, screw it. We're going to go, you know, we're going to go, you know, grow this company, you know, um, and, and was really enjoying, you know, like really enjoying it. Um, you know, fix and flip some things, wholesaled a bunch of stuff, like, like a lot of like new investors and my bankers cut me off at, at, at a point, you know, and I really started bemoaning, you know, bemoaning that fact to a friend of mine saying, oh, gee, I don't have any money, but I have this great deal. Like there's this, there's this light industrial building in, um, in Utah that I'd love to go buy. Um, you know, we can buy it for 30 cents on the dollar but I don't have any money. Um, and here's what my plan is. And we, the building had been completely stripped of anything of value. The HVAC systems were gone. The copper was gone. The, the hinges on the doors were gone. It was, it was amazing. Um, but long, long story short on that, on that deal in particular, it was like my friend was able to provide the capital capital to go be a part of that deal. And for us to go acquire that, my first foray into planning and development was doing a condominium plat on top of that light industrial building. And so we turned, we turned all the units in, in that building into a condominiumized industrial building and sold off the individual units to either tenants 
um, or to investors and eventually return in excess of Forex capital, um, you know, to the partners involved in that. So certainly a home run and it's like, oh, great, that's fantastic. Let's let's figure out a way to do that again. You know, because like some of the fixing and flipping and all of that stuff taught me a lot about the basics of real estate. And one of the biggest things in the when it comes to creation of value in real estate is a change in use. Is how do you how do you achieve the highest and best use of of a piece of property? You know, is it is it adding another bathroom if you're doing a small scale thing? Is it adding another bedroom, maybe? Or in the case, is it is it turning a horse pasture into a subdivision? Or in the case of this this light industrial building, turning it turning it into a condominiumized you know building and selling off the the, the individual units. Um, so really being able to step back and understand that um, has been been a crucial part of my career. Awesome. So you just talked about one good example of kind of how you got started and your background. So tell us about maybe a development you're most proud of. And if this is not the one you were going to use, would you also tell us about your foray into um, a downtown building in a very unique situation? Okay. I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, I don't know if that was the one you're most proud of, but I think it's cool. So if you were not going to use that one, do that one too. I'll do I'll start there. So, so we own a building, you know, what one of, or, or maybe, maybe we, Hmm. Let, can I ask for a, for a pause here a second? Let, let's reverse the question. Like, talk a little more philosophically about about this because it'll it'll help help people understand why these developments are are my favorites. Is that I'm not a typical developer, and that I'm not looking purely at the bottom line. I'm not. Wait a minute. Time out, because that was a huge admission right there so would you then argue that most developers are bottom line driven and that's the principal element of their consideration i th i think that there 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 is a certain percentage of developers in every community who solely look at the bottom line but Fair a vast enough. majority but a vast majority of them come to the table come to the planning table with the idea of I want to make my community a better place. Hmm. That's I think that good. that's a good point. I'm glad you went back yeah. philosophically because yeah. when we talked at the beginning about what mm -hmm. do developers think of planners and planners think of developers, I think we each think that each other isn't doing that. Right? right. So maybe that's like a great commonality as you talk about what your great projects are. Yeah, and I think I think the thing is is it, my approach has been you know, I, I look at it as my my big drive, my big belief of of we have we as a country have made a massive error following World War II, and that the way we've changed housing, the way we've done, you know, become more car centric and whatnot, and I think it's been destructive to our our society because we're as humans we are wired for connection. We we need the opportunities to connect and meet other people, to socialize, to be around our families, be around our friends. And you can you can apply that to development stuff. And one of the, some of the biggest errors and where, where I've been spending a lot of my time is trying to trying to do subdivisions that end up being more alley loaded. Because I cannot stand the Levitt town post-World War II Develop developments that we've been doing because what happens is is people will drive into their front loaded garages, open up you know open the garage, drive in, close the garage behind them, and for all they know is they've got Jeffrey Dahmer and Dahmer and the and the Unabomber <laughs> living on either side of them, and they never meet any of their neighbors, and I think that is detrimental to our country. I look at the I look at the real estate. Um, you know, I, I look at some of the retail and community other other things we do. We you know we try we try to do things that are around placemaking and to really have places where we meet. One of my favorite developments was um, was in Southeast Boise, and 
the entitlement work on that was quite complex because we had literally every layer of government involved in this. We had the state of Idaho, you had the federal government, you had the city of Boise, you had the county, you know, Ada County, and then, you know, the Department of Lands. It, it was really complex. Um, but the biggest piece about that is the way we designed the mailbox area. It isn't, you know, the, the idea, the idea was to, you know, we were paying and, and we were, I guess I'll back up a little bit and saying this deal also overlooks the Boise river and is 45 lots of single family housing. Um, we, we paid attention to the view corridors on this and cited the mailbox area so some and, and installed a bunch of benches around the mailbox area so somebody could go get their mail and then go sit down on one of those benches and overlook the Boise River. That's an example kind of our our philosophy when it comes to development in general is how do we create places for connection with somebody? How do we enable that third space to be created in some shape or form? So Lee, when it comes down to you, all the permitting and the layers of government you have to go through, I bet that that's just one aspect of things that maybe planners, especially young ones, may not understand about the complexity of this stuff. What are some of those other things, whether it's financing, some of these permitting issues? What do you see? So so by the time we even start meeting with, with any kind of planner, we this project has been underway typically for months. You were negotiating with a seller. We're working to identi first identify the project. Is the, is the project there? And then it's running the financial models on this. Like, what, what do you think I could possibly do with that? And then it's starting to spend money or, or then, it, then it's getting the project under contract so I can go buy it. And it's negotiating negotiating with a seller and trying to get the time that, that I need in order to do, to, to do a good project and to get through the entitlement process. And and once I have that project under on under contract, I'll work with our A and E staff to get our architectural and engineering stuff done, and then and then like maybe our tenth or fifteenth meeting that that we'll have for a single project is finally with the planning staff. So understand that by the time we come to you guys as planners, we're really deep into this project. We've probably spent tens of thousands of dollars. We've spent tons and tons of time, and there have been lots and lots of you know mental cycles that have occurred before we even get there. So understand that that the most valuable thing that we have is our time. And, so Lee, and, Lee a follow up on that. Mm -hmm. So you talk about you're at the ten or fifteenth meeting before you're meeting with planners. Um, but what about the other layers of government, even within the same, right, for development? So thinking about you, you know, I've, I've heard stories from you that you're kind of all the way through, you think you got a plan, you go to a round table, and all of a sudden fire's got something else, or health district has something else. Can you give us that experience speaking to planners? Like, how does that feel? And is there anything planners can do? I, you know, and, and, and that, you know, you, you bring up the most frustrating deal that I've ever done in my career, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. And, you know, we, we went through four round tables. So these are initial meetings to get our plan approved. We then went through planning and zoning. We then went through city council and everything got approved. We then closed on the, we then closed on the project. So I, I wrote at that point, I was $3 million deep into this project. I, we then, we then proceeded to go get our construction drawings, you know, approved the city, you know, city in this, this point, you know, every, you know, every agency inside the city was signed off on it. And then fire turned around and fire had been up at every single one of those round tables that we'd had. And during the construction drawing approval process decided they didn't like our fire access anymore. And so at that point, I was $3 million deep, the, the proud owner of an alfalfa field. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm a crappy farmer. Like, I am an awful farmer. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh, crap, what am I going to do? Because I just spent $3 million on an alfalfa field that doesn't pencil as alfalfa. 
and I've got this fire issue. And oh, by the way, like I am landlocked, you know, I, I am surrounded on the east and west sides by, you know, by a canal and a drain. And so my, my solution is to go spend a half a million dollars to build a culvert across, across that. And it was the most frustrating thing about that is because they were a part of that meeting. And then at the last minute, and once we'd spent even more money, that their minds changed. And I would just ask, like, as developers, we're okay with being told no, you know, but don't string somebody along, say, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. And then pull the rug out from underneath them because they're making, because we, we continue to make investments in a project as, as we go along, you know, and then, and this is the, this, you know, we're, we're actually going to put that project on the ground now because we've gotten some changes approved and whatnot. And it took, it, it took a lot of, a lot of politicking. It took a lot of, a lot of threats of legal action and whatnot around that deal. And I look um, at that with what I brought up in terms of did that particular instance either reveal a flaw in a policy or an inconsistency in implementing the policy? Because I, I can always say, hey, we're going to get tripped up by policy issues all the time as planning and zoning or decision makers. We should be then, even if, hey, I want to approve this or I can approve this, the next order, the next motion should be to bring us something back to remedy this policy because it caused an issue are those things that you run into how do planners maybe help bridge some of those yep. inconsistencies or disagreements the you know and I, I guess i would back up in answering that question is i, I think that that there needs to be a level of trust between planning staff and, and the development community um because i think we both approach each other with a deep level of, of suspicion oh that plan that that planner that that planner is out to screw me and you know the planning staff the planning staff turns around and says, well that developer is just gonna you know put up a parking lot you know and and keep going um and doesn't really care about this community and doesn't care about like what we what we want to see here in this community and and so obviously the 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 there is that intersection between policy and what i would say is in and what i have been trying to get is more freedom for planning staff, particularly executive planning staff like Sabrina, to have have freedom of approvals, um, and and to be able to override policy as written when something makes sense. So and you know and and we we haven't you know we've been slowly moving the needle on that. Yeah. But it's been challenging. So I got to ask, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, when you, when you get into the, the, the plans that a city has, and then you get into the individual personalities of the planners and maybe some general or sort of observations you've made in your, in your project from different States, some of those commonalities that you see on a regular basis that you just think, gosh, I wish that they would change this. I wish that they would have a different outlook on that. What are those types of things that you've thought about in all of these arduous, you know, processes that you've been through? I think just, just the biggest one is we spent, we spend a lot of time getting to know the planning staff. And I would, I would urge y'all as planners to get to know your developers, get to know them, sit, sit with them knee to knee and get to know them because you'll find that, that they really care about the communities more than, than you think about. And I think that it's so easy to turn around as, you know, turn around and say, okay, well, I have, I have this, this thing to do instead of going out and grabbing a cocktail or whatever with, um, with your developer, with your developers, you know, we spend a lot of time on the politics of, of development. We spend a lot of time getting to know our city councilmen and our council members in the cities we operate. We spend a lot of time with, with the development with the P and Z staff, getting to know them, you know. So I, I, we we are fortunate enough because we we spend that time up front that we are able to kind of really shape the projects going into it, and we know what the answer is going to be going into 
into it because we've spent the time and we've gotten to know the planners. It isn't that we're, we're looking, you know, we're getting special favors or anything like that. We, we just understand each other and, and we're, we're able to operate from the same side of the table as opposed to, to the opposite side of the table. So that's, guess, an, that's an so. awesome point that you kind of talked about, or we talked about at the beginning of like seeing each other as adversaries versus understanding. So most of what we talked about so far has been more about like project implementation and where there can be challenges in implementation. So I have a question that I've actually been wanting to ask you for a while. So we'll ask here. Um, why do you feel that most developers are not involved or engaged at the upfront side? And by upfront, I mean, in what I think it was Don that mentioned at the long range planning, right? So why are developers not as involved in spending their time in comprehensive planning or ordinance development? Because instead, and, and I, here's my, I'm going to ask this as an adversarial, we wait till the end and it's like, well, that's not working for us and we want you to modify it, right? And then people like myself or planners are like, well, okay, how do we do that? And then we're getting into these one-offs of how do we modify versus mm -hmm. how or why are developers not engaged up front? And is it trust? Is it time? Is it they don't see the value? And then what can we do about it as planners? I, I think it, I think there there's a lot of there's a lot of trust issues, um, in that we feel like if we get involved and we we state an opinion that it's going to come back and haunt us at a later time. I think that there's there's just kind of a lack of. Like I said, it, it's the rela the relationship building up front because again, we we're different in that we invest we make that investment of time to get to know somebody. But very rarely do I ever get a planner or staff reach out and say, "Hey, let's go grab a cocktail. Let's let's go grab a coffee." I just you that's know, because I wanted they to talk drill to it them. into our ethics thing that oh, you might have a buy a coffee to get my development through that question comes up all the dang time and doesn't even address some of the other ethical issues so we right. kind of joke about that but yeah it does seem like the the more personal just hey you know i want to achieve this vision what gaps do you see um versus let's draw a bubble on a map that's not based in any market reality or any other conditions but that's the land use we want there because of why i don't know yeah well, and, that, and, and, that's and, and, and that's that's that that's that's exactly it in and that's the challenge and i guess i would urge urge you all to f figure that out is like how do you how do you build the relationships because if you need some help on from the development community it's easy to easy to pick up the phone and call a guy that you know as opposed to like gee that guy sent in an application and he's just another number or another name on a, on a form i i think a lot of that that's true and and i'm speaking from the public sector side is what don said about perception right it's it's okay for planners in, in general to reach out and involve kind of advocacy groups or people that are um, on, on all sides of issues, right, to engage. But it seems like there's this almost taboo about, well, how do you have developers involved? Because then you're going to be perceived to be um, aligned with developers when an application comes through, right? And that's a dichotomy that kind of was within the question of like, how do we make that work, right? How do we not make it personal and make sure that we're still getting that input up front? Yeah, I think that I don't know. The thing is, is, is there's a difference between an active application and and when you're talking to somebody, as, as opposed to being able to to step out of the office and talk to somebody philosophically about, hey, like what what are your biggest needs? Like, there's one city we operate in, literally has no developable multifamily ground inside inside the city. You know, and and PNC staff turned around, in, and there there was one there was one alternative way to get to build multifamily in this community, and PNC staff took turned around in a vacuum and removed that option, mm -hmm. and so now that city is desperately short of multifamily units because of that. And there's nothing in the pipeline anymore. Hmm. Yeah. So other advice for the planners out there: go have a cocktail. Yep. Go, go, Don't. go have a cocktail. One, one is it's a great stress reliever. <laughs> it's a great stress reliever. Get out of the office. Um, well, and, and other advice, I think back, I, I remember just all the, the moaning and groaning and stuff about Walmart. So oh, the Walmart looks so awful, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I can go show you a Walmart 
that looks great with wood timber and other things because the city actually had those policies yep. in place so they could could meet them. So it's just don't demean the Walmart. We might not be able to avoid a Walmart in our community, but we do have control of how it's formatted and what it looks like. A hundred percent. And and I guess that, that's where I go back to my original point. And one of the things I'm really working on is trying to get, get the communities that we work in to give executive staff, you know, some leniency and discretion over the projects. For example, I would love to paint my buildings, you know, some of the retail projects that we've done a, a color besides beige, <laughs> you know, how, like there, there's so many times driving around Dallas that, that, you could literally, you know, you go by a strip center and it could literally be anywhere in the country, you know? And I go back to the philosophical thing that I talked about, about creating place and creating distinct sorts of things. And I well, think- I can't London, tell you the number of times I use the phrase like that business park looks like it parachuted in from Dallas. So <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. You know, um, you know, it's a, it's the same salad beauty supply and, you know, the, the, you know, sport clips and, and whatnot. And <laughs> it's, it's awful. It's awful. And I would like to be able to have more creativity. I'd like to be able to do things like, you know, a Walmart with, with a facade that looks differently. But I also find, find that, some of the upfront costs and also dealing with the planners, it's easy to default to boring. Hmm. There's a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> There's the APA theme for next yeah. year. <laughs> it, it, it's, and, and, and that's the thing is, is that risk taking is not encouraged from a planning standpoint. And I think a lot of planners don't understand the risk elements of, of a deal. And, and so like it's, it's, there's financial risk in there there's there's just physical risk in this is like gee if i if i build the building this way do, does it still maintain its economic viability you know it's also a reputational risk of like having having a project blow up on you because you know from the capital standpoint like having a project blow up on you means means you may not be able to go recruit investors to be a part of your projects you may not be able to get get your debt financing put in place on this. So I, I think that's also probably another message to planning staff is understand the risk, you know, and and most developers will share their performance with you and help you understand. And sure, yes, we 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 do make good money. There's also projects that blow up at us. There's all there's also pro, there, there's also projects, you know that that could be better from both the planning standpoint and whatnot, but we've defaulted to boring. Mm. Mm. Because it's not as controversial or it doesn't have as much pushback because it's super predictable, right? That's it. And yeah, yeah. Um I, I love this line of, of thought. And you know I wish that us as planners would look at market conditions more often and understand the costs of things that are having to be put out up front. Um, I, 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 you know, and I'm going to be extreme in this example, but we're not, we're not minstrels. We're not, we don't, we don't create a plan and then make puppets to dance to that plan. Like we're, that's not our job. And I think so often that's kind of how we see things a little bit, or some people can of just sort of like, well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't uh, that doesn't meet every single mark of our whatever you fill in the blank kind of a plan, and you you know because there's nothing at stake for the planner per se. There's no time. There's no time. There's no financial sand through the hourglass that's coming through in that first payment that you have to make with an interest payment and nothing to show for. It. Yeah. You don't. You well, know con co contractors that you might have lined up in a couple of months, assuming the predictability of a process and then something happens and blows up. And now you've got a huge problem getting all of those contractors back. Right. And in, mm -hmm. and in line, if you're in a busy market in particular. So yep. there's so many different variables. I wish that the word I would hope that we would as an industry use more is empathy yep. is, is, is really understanding this whole dynamic 
from the other perspective more so than maybe what we do. So Chris, you had two years in graduate school. So did I. How, how many development finance courses or modules did you have in those two years? Uh, none. No, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think we had any. And that's something that I, should be should be pursued. And so, Lee, I'll, that's a good tee up for yeah. this question. If you go to the source of us planners, <laughs> academia, mostly, right? Undergrad, grad school, wherever someone's getting their degree or master's degree or whatever it is. If you could create a course and and get into those young minds before they get into the profession, what kind of things do you think you would teach them? I certainly think the finance aspects of it is really important. I think um, if anything, I would do a, a real sim a real development simulation with that. So take a project from a bare piece of ground. So as I like to say, from trees to keys or horse pastures to homes and actually kind of do it, you know, have them ask the question, you know, from like, there's the planning aspects of the fun, the, the, you know, have them learn how to negotiate with the seller, you know, how, how do you get the best terms that, that work with everybody? How do you then go raise the capital to go purchase the, the property? You know, like I, I, I started my company with $85,000 that I'd managed to save. You know, um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to learn, learn how to raise money from different high net worth individuals across the country, but they don't teach that in school. And, and then it's of course the fun part that everybody goes to school for, if you're going to planner is, is it's like the pretty buildings and the layouts and, and all of that fun stuff. But it's understanding what does that process really look like, and like where does that blow up, and what are the potential risks. And so, you know, you, you, if you're running a board game or something like that, it's like, oh well, you know, you're you're doing this development, and you go to the planning staff, and it blows up, and you get sent back to go, you know, you or get sent sent straight to jail. <laughs> do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars, um, and keep rolling keep rolling your dice until until you get out of jail. Um, I think take you know having somebody do a simulated project mm. all the all the way you know like all the way through I think would be highly valuable because I've seen so few architects and so few planners actually have real world experience and actually putting their money on the line their reputation on the line. Lee, you just inspired my mind to think of the world's lamest board game, which is a prequel to Monopoly because in Monopoly, like you just described, <laughs> here's your little red hotel. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Does it go with the plan? Does it go with setbacks and parking? No, wait a minute. So <laughs> how do we, uh, what's that board game look like? And how do we sell it to the masses of like the eight people in this country who would play it? You know? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's 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 a school requirement, so it's you know pl plan planning planning two hundred one in order to get your degree. So it is <laughs> is is what it is. You know, it's you know as a kid, you know, like you you know do the whole play the cash flow board game or something from Robert Kiyosaki or something. You know, it teaches you a lot about business and so on. You, I, I I would agree with you that that there need, there needs to be some sort of game along the way. You know, you you see it. In your finance classes, particularly if you're pursuing a finance degree, you know, you'll see somebody do a stock market simulation and run a fund and to run run that sort of thing. And, and I think it's a real it's a real loss because we see this all the time, you know, from our planner staff. It's like they, they have a great like philosophy. They don't know. They don't understand like the physical and economic realities of a project, you know, that, and, that and, sounds a bit like so cards against humanity. There's a game that was out a few years ago. The three of us are laughing because we've seen it. It's the Cards Against Urbanity. Mm -hmm. It's like the planner version of Cards Against Humanity. Oh, so I kind of feel like this is our retirement gig. The four of us, we're going to develop the like version of that pre-monopoly that then we can sell out for part of like, you know, the classroom situation and plan. I was thinking together. we could do like developers of Catan instead oh, of settlers of Catan. That's that would kind be, of a fun you know, one. Yeah, we've go. gotten more cerebral with board games. Surely we can modify one to get at this. So maybe that's the challenge for our listeners is, you know, send in through uh, our social media platforms. What would you call that game and what should be involved? Ooh, we'll, yeah. we'll start crowdsourcing a game for that. So 
All go. right. So I know we're running out of time. So I have I have one last question before we get to the lightning round. And I'm going to bring us back to something really specific. So kind of in the front, I said, tell us about a development you're proud of. And then I brought up the downtown. So I'm going to talk about non kind of traditional residential greenfield development. So in some of the other development that as planners, we're like, oh yeah, we want infill. We want our downtown buildings redone, all of that. Give us a very specific piece of advice that people should know. And by this, I'm going to give you a lead in. Talk about trash and parking. <laughs> Just like very <laughs> tangible. How do you take a big idea and be like, redevelop downtown? And then you're like, uh-oh, we got this building and we got trash and parking issues. And and that's the thing. Like, like the, the building you're, you're referencing is is a part of a a downtown area that is redeveloping really quickly they've done the city has done a great job of creating a plaza um and we we went to it thinking we went into that project thinking gee we would love to you know and the, the building the building we own has a, a basement is nine thousand square feet has a basement first floor and then a second floor dates back to the 1880s and I approached it from the standpoint thinking of I wanted to put apartments on the second floor. Once we really got into it, realized, gee, I'm not going to be able to charge the premium rents for these units because the city couldn't get its act together when it came to trash because I couldn't ask my tenants like the nearest where, where the city was going to make my tenants require or was going to require my tenants to drop their trash off was three blocks away. The city, furthermore, wouldn't wouldn't do any kind of loading zones or guaranteed parking for me. So again, how would I how would I ask for premium rents and ask a sit or ask a tenant to go walk a car full of groceries three or four blocks? And and so we've we've now stepped back from from that idea, you know, and and we're going to end up doing office space up there. You know, we'll we'll still maintain some of the cool aspects of the apartments we were going to do. So this particular building overlooks the plaza. And so we'll end up doing a balcony um, in one of the office units that enables people to to go out and entertain and all of that. It goes back to my philosophy about, you know, we're wired for connection. So how do we create spaces that that enable connection? And yeah, so it, it's it's that particular building. You know, we still remain excited about, but I, I I don't know how to move the process that that process particularly faster because like the parking issue is particularly contentious because nobody nobody wanted to pay for parking. Nobody wanted nobody wanted to to look at parking any different than the way they were doing it, which you know I think we can all agree. As developers and as planners, the, the parking situation wasn't working. So I just brought that one up before we jump into lightning round. It's a very specific kind of what's the advice, right? Of as a practitioner who's worked on the development side and then in more greenfield side, the details matter, right? And that's the creativity. If we have these great theories and almost every downtown is talking about wanting to have residential above commercial, but the practicality of that isn't always figured out up front and it can really ruin the project in places that you said that is about connections. So anyway, yeah. I, I really appreciate that really practical advice for people as we're thinking about the planning up front. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mixed use development is a whole other ball of wax. And that's one of those topics my uh, family member and I go back and forth about because he's of the mindset, it doesn't pencil, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know, and I'm kind of going, I've seen it work, you know, and these things called cities somehow have figured it out. <laughs> but, you know, I'm also not the one fronting the capital and the risk in a place that may not have good examples or to your mm -hmm. point, Lee, maybe be ready for that type of a development because it was absent for the better part of 70 years. And now there's a desire to bring it back. So lots and of, then, yeah, well, and I guess it's Sabrina's point about it is the details matter is, is yeah. that you know, how, how do you deal with transportation? Like where do people park or how do people get to that place? It's really, you can have a really good place, but if nobody ever sees it, does it matter? And for yeah. residential specifically in that environment, we can't take a Manhattan, DC, Boston for a place that's trying to change the paradigm. It, that's not going to occur overnight. And we have to find the policy mm -hmm. solution when something like that trips us up, perhaps inadvertently. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. Very good. Lee Jin Key, managing partner of Pontifex Capital. A lot of good insight. We appreciate uh, everything that you've gone through, all your war stories and lessons learned. So let's turn the page. I'm going to ask you a few lightning question, lightning round questions, and then my colleagues will probably do the same here. I'll start off with something uh, you've mentioned on a few occasions, these, these places that you enjoy, you seek to, to go to interact and placemaking concepts. I'm curious, what's a place, your, what's your go-to place? Is it a vacation spot? Is it somewhere that's always on the tip of your mind that you just, man, I can't wait to get back to? Where is that place? I, my favorite, well, I have two, two of my most favorite cities in this country are, is Santa Barbara, California um and santa fe new mexico ah. and i think that they have done a really good job with placemaking in that you also look from a planning and design standpoint is both of them are, are very unique in in the way that they do their architecture and their and those requirements there you know you're in santa barbara you know just by walking around like you see the tile roofs you see that sort of, you know you see the tile roofs and you see the mission revival architecture you know, on, and even the newer buildings. Santa Fe is, there's something about the square and all the other thing, you know, and, and the art galleries and all of that, that I re really supremely enjoy. And those, those, those happen to be two places I spend a lot of time because, because they, from a philosophical standpoint, that's kind of where I'd like us to, like us to go. Very nice. All right. You are in the state of Texas. Texas has a deep, deep uh, love of music. I'm curious, who's your favorite Texas musician? Texas musician? Good golly. I, There's a I, think lot. He's a Texas, I don't think he's a Texas musician, but been listening to a lot of Chris Stapleton again for some ah, reason. Ah, yeah, definitely. I think he's a Kentucky much. guy. Yeah. How about Stevie Ray Vaughan? Oh man. Okay. I, mean, I can, you know? I can buy that. I can buy that. Um, Modern Beyonce. She's killing it going. And she's now a country star apparently. So there's <laughs> no, that. No, that, no, that, no. That, that. That is very true. That is yeah. very true. That is very true. All right. One more for me. Also a Texas theme. Do you enjoy some Texas barbecue? And if you do, what's your, what is your go-to when you, oh, uh, no. when you hit up mesquite mostly, right? I think that's uh, the, yeah the yeah yeah so one of my favorite restaurants in in dallas is the pecan lodge in in deep ellum um you know you want to talk about great place making great great planning is that whole deep ellum neighborhood and how they've turned that around um but it also happens to feature what i would argue one of the best you know one of the best barbecue places in texas is the hmm. pecan lodge hmm. i have to remember that what's your favorite whiskey Favorite whiskey is, is uh, Booker's. You know, I, I like the high test, you know, breathing fire. Uh, <laughs> bourbon. So there's the good news about that is, is like there's plenty of flavor inside that heat. So, oh, that is that's true. That's true. I've been a Booker's fan since high school. <laughs> oh, I don't know if there's a statute of limitations of saying you were drinking in high yeah, school. I don't know. That was when they were part of the Kentucky Bourbon Circle, and you got a monthly newsletter <laughs> oh, really? from them on that yeah. so if i were to guess if you were to guess a percentage of photos on your phone that are of other quality or bad development what percentage would that be <laughs> the the problem is is they're etched in my mind for forever it's kind of kind of kind of like a you know childhood scar or something uh, <laughs> we I, I i tend to take pictures of good development and as as, as a as a memory of like gee i want to go take that somewhere else um so so not no it's, it's it's a very it's a very low percentage of okay. pictures of bad developments it tends to be more of my dog but you know <laughs> we do ask that question a lot because mine are mostly of my dog yeah. don do you have another one are you good okay so i have a couple don took my phone one but all right if you could do a project in one city slash country outside of the u.s what would be it Ooh. And it can't start with the word or the name Santa. Santa. Santa Claus, Indiana. <laughs> no. no. Santa Claus, outside Indiana. the U.S. Outside oh. the U.S. Outside the U.S. Hmm. Man, lots of. I I what 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 I would go. So I I travel a ton. I travel a ton, and I think that's influenced a lot of like my planning and development philosophy or, or philosophy. It, is I'd go to Latin America. 
um, one of the things I, I love about Latin America is, is like their dedication to place. Um, in their downtowns, you're going to find, find a square. In the downtowns, you're going to find a church, typically. You're going to find the government buildings. You're going to find the restaurants. You're going to find a sea of color because all the buildings are painted bright colors and aren't the same color of beige that, that we so love here in the United States. <laughs> You also see people milling about. You see the street vendors um, out there trying to sell and trying to scrape through and, and sell whatever they're selling. I think you also see more independent kids and youth. That 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 then and that's it, right? Is, is if if we're able to successfully create place like that and community like that, you're able to release your kids to go do do their things and live their independent lives and, and all of that. And I think that we're really missing that here in this country. And, and I would really, really like us, you know, just as a planning community and a development community to really be thinking about that. It's like, how do, how do we create places to where it's safe for our kids to be there on their own? Mm. You know, it's safe for, for our grandparents to walk around and enjoy and be in, live active independent lives. And it's also say it's it's also a, a place a great place to do commerce and to you know be together and and to connect. So that sounds an awful like what planners' answers are too. So maybe the whole message, the whole message of this this uh, episode is just we're a lot closer together than maybe we think. So I got he one. He just last wrote question. the vision statement for the comp plan. I, yeah, I, mean, I did. Isn't... I just wrote it. Come together. All right. One and last I was, question. I was I was just thinking real quick that. We're we're talking with a developer who might be as idealistic as any planner I've met. So I love it. Good for yeah. you. Well, and that's why I kept saying one last question because we could we could have this episode go on and on. Yeah. So pulling that together, you let's say you get to choose a career all over again. You get to start yeah. back over to twenty two year old Lee coming out of school. It cannot be a developer, and despite everything we've heard today, it cannot be a planner because I know that's what you really want to be in life. So it can't be those two things. What would it be? Good question. I, I, I've always threatened to be a yoga teacher on the beach um, in Mexico <laughs> would be one of them. Uh, but if I was going to go be a pro, be a professional, um, some, something finance related. So. Yoga teacher on the beach. I think you should just stay with that one. Don't go finance. Like just stick okay. with yoga teacher on the beach and we'll, we'll end the episode with that. Deal. Deal. Those mats are a lot easier to finance. <laughs> Tell me about it, right? So, so grittier, so grittier than the the four dollars a foot for my my hardwood floors these days. So. There you go. I I I would challenge you, given your your bachelor's degree, which you you clearly have no interest in what you learned with your English philosophical or philosophy degree or whatever it was but i would teach you i would tell you teach the yoga class in the voice of shakespeare like let's oh. just go all in I'll go and, all in yeah, or no, teach yeah. the yoga class in the voice of the zoning code oh, oh. Right, right. well we, we want to we want to keep people awake through the class not <laughs> and depressed and we want to enliven them not depress them yeah that, that that's exactly it that's exactly it so very good all right, Lee Jenke, we really appreciate you taking the time and and uh, supporting some of our theories on what developers <laughs> may be thinking about planners challenging in some other ways. And for our audience, I certainly hope that you all have learned some things. I know we certainly have. So Lee, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you all for having me. It's It's been a real pleasure. Awesome. Okay, to our audience, reminder, head on over to our website, Podcast, YouTube, Apple, Amazon, all those good things. Give us a like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. So to my fellow commissioners, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll see you again soon. Hey, everybody. Commissioner Danley here. Would you like to see more? Hear more? Well, we got you covered. Go to our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. It's got everything you want. Guests, yep, past episodes, the video, the audio, even our whiskey pairing. Links to everything about all the people we've had on. Books, websites, you name it. It's unbelievable. If you want to reach out to us, please, we'd be more than happy to chat. You can email us, planningcommissionpodcast at gmail.com. You want to tweet at us? Go for it. At Planning Commission. We're also on YouTube with the Planning Commission Podcast channel. 
Facebook. Heck, send us a carrier pigeon if you need to. We'd love to hear from you about ideas, guests, you name it. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. We'll keep doing our thing. You keep doing yours. Have a good one.